Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Vista Lounge. For those of you that haven't met, I'm Shane, your cruise director. Thank you so much for joining us, and it's my pleasure to introduce our guest presenter for today. He's actually been traveling with us uh, for a little over two weeks, and he does a fantastic job. You're really going to enjoy him. He is an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Please put your hands together and welcome Charles McClellan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. So glad that you could be here on this beautiful day in paradise on the beautiful, elegant Westerdam. Great. That's my name for those of you who have, not, uh, who have recently joined us, and that's my email address. As I've indicated in one of the earlier lectures, um, I have some of my lectures on YouTube right now. And you can uh, type in Charles McClellan Cruise Lectures. And there's one on the Inca and a, and a few clips from earlier lectures. I, uh, Dave and the, David and the technical crew have been recording all of these lectures. And I hope to be able to go home and load them all up on YouTube. And if I'm not able to do that, and sometimes there are restrictions, and I may not be able to do that, um, I'm uh, trying to look at establishing a website as well. Uh, my new friend, Fred, um, is uh, going to work with me and, and perhaps help me to make that happen. But the idea is, if you'd like to send me an email and tell me, uh, keep me posted on how things are going on getting your, your information, your lectures up on the internet, uh, I'll be happy to keep you abreast of how that's going. I'd like to welcome all of the new people here today, and uh, I'm so glad that you're on the ship because now I'll be able to blend in with you. Let me explain. My wife disembarked yesterday. There was a major family issue that she needed to take care of. And now, instead of being the only person wandering around the ship, do I go to the aft or to the stern? Do I go up or down to port or starboard? I'll blend right in with the rest of you who are new, uh, who are still trying to find your way around the ship. Um, well, welcome. Um, as usual, I do a little bit of housekeeping at the beginning of the lecture as, as, uh, to correct myself on, on previous lectures. And those of you who were with us before San Diego will recall that uh, I gave a lecture on the Inca and that there were three domesticated animals in the uh, Inca Empire. The guinea pig, the llama, and the alpaca. And I was shocked yesterday as I went on the internet in San Diego to learn that there might have been a fourth species. <laughs> Look carefully. <laughs> okay, let's go on. Um, on a more serious note, piracy. This is a quote from Black Bart Roberts. I'll tell you a little bit more about Black Bart in a few minutes. He was the most, one of the most successful pirates. Um, but we have been, those of us who have been on the, the uh, Westerdam for uh, this whole cruise, we've been sailing in waters that were teeming with pirates. That's a, that is a Jolly Roger. That was just a few days ago. Puerto Vallarta, they were all over the place. Cabo San Lucas, my goodness. It's, it's a good fortune that we were able to get this far through all of the pirate-infested waters. Well, it's a topic that is just fascinating to people. And uh, you, many of you are of my generation, and our perception of pirates was probably driven... Oh, I forgot to mention... Piracy, it's used to sell chewing gum, rum, various kinds of insurance, and it's the, uh, the icon for, for baseball teams and football teams and so forth. But those of us who are of my generation, uh, our perception of piracy was generally uh, developed at a fairly young age by this movie. It came out in the 1950s. Um, it was a Walt Disney movie. And it just made all made such an impact on me. I would lie in bed at night, and of course I associated with Jim Hawkins, and I listened for that peg leg from Long John Silver coming up the steps. I couldn't go to sleep, I was so terrified. 
So hopefully you weren't as, as traumatized by that movie as I was. But our perception of piracy, uh, those of us who, who grew up at that point in time, was really driven by this movie. And of course today, uh, later generations, their perception of privacy, or of piracy rather, is driven by this series of movies. And just as uh, Treasure Island had s gave some misconceptions about piracy, so does this one as well. Of course, the, the young people today think that pirates are, are slightly tipsy individuals who stock up on eye makeup whenever it's on sale. <laughs> but of course, the reality is somewhat different. So let's take a look at the difference between myth and reality. And these are some of the, the most uh, important myths that people have had about piracy over the years. Pirates killed everyone on board the captured ship. Well, the reality of it was they didn't want to kill anybody. They didn't want to destroy anything. They, they wanted the ship to surrender without a fight. And in fact, many ships did because they were so terrified of the Jolly Roger. Pirates were only interested in gold and silver. They were interested in anything that could have a dollar sign attached to it. They stole everything. Medicine, tools, food, slaves, cargo, anything. And that being the case, pirates didn't bury their treasure. They spent it quickly on wine and women. The, the term deferred gratification had absolutely no meaning. <laughs> no meaning whatsoever to the pirates. They sank most of the ships they captured well as uh, I indicated a moment ago, they, they really did not want to kill anybody, they didn't want to sink any ships, they wanted to capture them, and those ships became either pirate ships or ransomed, were ransomed back to the owners of the ship. And then of course, the special language, <clears throat> yo-ho, shiver me timbers, ar, that kind of stuff. Ridiculous, many of those words were, were created by Robert Louis Stevenson when he wrote the book Treasure Island. So, we really have a very different, um, our understanding of piracy, for most of us, is quite different than the reality. And um, the name of this lecture is called Under the Black Flag, and the, the book by that name, uh, the author wrote, the fact is that we want to believe in the world of pirates as it has been portrayed in the adventure stories and films over the years. We want the myths, the buried treasure, the walking the plank, the resolute pirate captains with their cutlasses and earrings, the seamen with their wooden legs and parrots. We prefer to forget the barbaric tortures and the hangings, the desperate plight of men shipwrecked on hostile coasts. For most of us, the pirates will always be romantic outlaws living far from civilization on some sunny, distant shore. Well, the reality is that they were not. Our focus today will be on piracy in the Caribbean. We're just only focusing on that part of the world and also during a fairly limited period of time, approximately 1500 to 1730. Of course, piracy has existed since the beginning of recorded time. Uh, there were uh, the sea people in the Mediterranean at the very beginning of recorded time who terrorized the Mediterranean. The Vikings, of course, were pirates uh, and today, just today, there's piracy off the coast of Somalia, off the coast of Nigeria, the Niger Delta, um, in Indonesia, in, the, in Singapore, in that area, that part of the world as well. Piracy continues to exist in the world today. Now, who were the pirates? The average age at death of the pirates, so they didn't live a long time, was 27. But as you'll see, uh, look at the context of that, the average length of life at that time was only 30 to 35. So um, they, they did die younger, but it wasn't that premature. As far as the nationalities, many of them, in fact, the vast majority of them came from uh, the countries of the uh, British Isles, Wales and, and Ireland and Scotland and England. And of course, there were Dutch and French Huguenots as well. As far as the source, the recruitment source for pirates, these are the four main sources. Number one, crews of captured merchant ships. The crews of, of merchant ships worked very, very hard. Uh, a a hundred-ton merchant ship might only have 
uh, 14 to 20 crew members to sail that ship. A pirate ship of similar size would have over a hundred people. So consequently, it was a much uh, easier life in many respects. So when a pirate ship captured a merchant ship, they would say, hey, anybody want to join up and come on board? And many of them took that opportunity to become pirates. Deserters from the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy at that point in time was staffed by something called impressing. A, a British Royal Navy ship would sail into a port and they would send press gangs out and kidnap people. And they would take them to the ship and sail off and they were almost like slaves. And they were treated very, very harshly and brutally. The disciplinary actions of the, the, the uh, Royal Navy at that point in time were just horrific. And so whenever they could, they would desert ship and then join up with the pirates. Adventurers who came to the Western Hemisphere and couldn't make a living. There were a lot of people who came here lured by the prospect of gold and silver and quick and easy riches, and it didn't turn out that way, so they turned to piracy. And then finally, runaway slaves. A fairly large percentage of the pirate crews were black slaves who had run away from their masters. And there was no concern at all about race. As long as they could carry their weight, they were welcome to become members of the pirate crew. Privateer or pirate, these are two terms that are often um, used interchangeably and they are very closely related, but there is a distinct difference. At the time that we're looking at, most, many of the nations of Europe were almost in a state of constant warfare. Uh, there were uh, allegiances and changing allegiances and, and war was just pretty much a, a uh, all the time kind of a thing. And so the monarchies of the, of the maritime countries would deputize ships to go out and prey on the fleets and the merchant uh, marines of the countries that they were fighting at that point in time. It was almost like 007. They were given a license to pillage, to plunder, to kill, all in the name of the crown. And of course, the crown got a certain percentage of the plunder. And it also weakened their enemies. Now, from time to time, peace would break out on the continent. And the privateers, by the way, this is a letter of Mark. That was the document that authorized individuals to go out and become privateers. And this one is for Henry Morgan, one of the most uh, famous pirates of all. So from time to time, peace would break out and the, there would, uh, this letter of Mark would in effect be null and void at that point in time. So what would you call an unemployed privateer? A pirate. They had a skill set that they wanted to continue using. If they were not sanctioned by the law to do that, they would just do it on their own. So privateers became pirates when uh, there was peace. Now this is perhaps a fairly common perception of what a pirate ship would look like. Huge, dark, foreboding, um, absolutely terrifying. Well, the reality is up until the late 1600s, they were very, very small ships called sloops, single mast. Uh, they put as much sail on them as they could, but still with just one mast, they, they couldn't go all that fast. In the 1700s, along came sloops, uh, significantly larger ships with multiple masks, masts rather, and they could sail much faster and also they had much more room for cargo, for plunder and so forth. And with the passage of time, larger ships came into common use. Brigantines then became the ship of choice. So whenever the pirates were able to capture a brigantine, if they were sailing a schooner at that point in time, they would then upgrade to the brigantine. And so obviously that was able to accommodate a much larger crew and much more room for supplies and for plunder. <coughs> now life on board a pirate ship was anything but romantic in a happy cruise. Nothing like the Westerdam at all. For one thing, it was boring. They didn't have all the activities that we have. They would sail for weeks and maybe even months at a time without seeing another ship. 
And so they would while away their time playing cards or, or carving bone or hard cheese. Uh, if there was anybody on the ship who played a musical instrument, they were uh, the most popular person on the ship. And even many of them, uh, according to the records that we have, took up knitting as well. Is that an image that's hard to reconcile? <laughs> A pirate with a patch over his eye knitting a sweater for his grandchild. It's really a bizarre concept. Okay, so it was boring. It was crowded. There might be as many as, as 200 people crammed into a space only 120 by 40 feet. And so it was extremely crowded, as you can imagine, on these long voyages. It was filthy. The below decks were very dark and damp. They were infested by cockroaches, lice, maggots, weevils, rats. All, it was just a terribly, terribly unhealthy situation. And because of that unhealthy situation, there were a lot of health issues on the ship. It wasn't unusual at all for a pirate ship to lose half of its crew on a long voyage due to the effects of malaria yellow fever, scurvy, dysentery, gangrene, venereal disease, on and on and on. And consequently, life on board a pirate ship was anything but a happy experience. The food, my goodness, we have been so spoiled on this cruise. Um, I don't know about you, but the salt water is shrinking my clothing. That's all I can attribute it to, you know. <laughs> the, the salt air, the salt air is, is just shrinks clothing. That's my story. I'm sticking with it. Okay, salted beef and pork. This was, they had to salt the beef and pork so heavily because otherwise it would become un inedible after a short period of time. And in fact, it became... It was so salty that they would soak it in salt water in order to remove some of the salt, if you can imagine that. Of course, from time to time they would catch fish and turtles, but that was certainly not a major source of, of uh, animal protein. But one, they, there is recorded on, on one ship, a long voyage back to Europe, where they ran out of salted beef and pork, and they were able to capture approximately 4,000 rats that they used for animal protein for that long voyage. Hardtack was nothing more than water and flour combined and baked to a rock-like consistency. It was so dry and hard that the idea was that it would last a long time. And that would have worked except that often uh, it became infested with maggots. And there was, a, uh, according to one report, if the maggot that emerges from your hardtack is thick and gray, that means the, the hardtack is still very nutritious. If it's thin and white, that means there is no more nutrition available in the hardtack. And if weevils infested the hardtack, it would just crumble into dust. So they really didn't have much good food at all. And you can imagine what the water was like after they'd been sailing on the ocean for a while. It became covered with algae and totally almost uh, undrinkable. And so as a strategy for making the water more palatable, they would mix it with rum and other forms of alcoholic beverages. And of course, the combination of rum and water is called grog. You might have heard that term before. Now this is perhaps the perception from, that we have from movies of the kind of clothing that pirates wore. The reality was this. They'd have a head covering, a bandana of some kind, a waistcoat that would provide protection from the elements, canvas uh, pants that would go a little bit below the knees, and sometimes they would have shoes, a lot of times they didn't because they were climbing in the rigging a lot and they would not be wearing shoes when they were up in the, in the sails. They only had, generally speaking, one pair of clothing that they wore 24-7 in the rain, exposed to the elements, and of course many of them slept on the deck because of the, the awful uh, below deck situation. 
And you can imagine, after a relatively short period of time, it became you were just hoping there was a strong wind that was blowing uh, the odor off the ship. Pirate weapons. The cutlass was the main weapon of choice, approximately two feet long, a very heavy, thick, curved blade that was very, very strong. It was able to cut um, rope, canvas, and, of course, bone. The dagger was used for close-end fighting, where one could not swing the cutlass. The dagger then became the weapon that was uh, the most efficient. And not very many pirates had flintlock pistols. In fact, it was such a, uh, a, a wonderful thing to have that the first pirate who was able to uh, get on the ship that was being attacked was often awarded a pistol in recognition of their bravery and their accomplishment. Trouble with flintlock pistols is they only fired once. And so um, a person would need to co sort of conserve their ammunition and only use it in the most desperate situation. By far the most devastating weapon that a pirate might have, and they weren't that common, but the most devastating weapon, personal weapon, was a blunderbuss. Two to three feet long, uh, 15 to 20 pounds in weight. They would cram nails and grape shot and glass and anything that could do damage to a person into the two inch bore of the barrel, and they would jam all of that in there, and of course, in a, it, it, it didn't have a very long range, it was only good for about 10 feet, but it would, it would devastate uh, anyone who happened to be within 10 feet of the weapon when it was fired. As far as cannon were concerned, they were classified according to the weight of the projectiles that they fired. Therefore, a, a two-pound cannon fired uh, projectiles that weighed two pounds. They weighed 200 times the weight of the projectile. So a two-pound cannon actually weighed 200 pounds. A four-pounder would weigh 800 pounds. The weapons, the, uh, the cannons, were crewed by normally three people. They could reload approximately every couple of minutes. And they had a, a range of 1,000 yards, but they were so inaccurate that they generally would not fire them until they were within uh, one or 200 yards of the ship that they were attacking. And again, they would only aim at the rigging. They were not trying to sink the ship. That would have been counterproductive. Swivel guns, as the name implies, are very, very uh, flexible in terms of aiming them. And they were... Uh, mounted on the, the uh, deck of the ship and were only used as the two ships came close to each other. They were anti-personnel weapons. They would load them with grape shot. And then when, when they were only approximately from me to the front row away, they would fire and that would clear the deck of the opposing ship. <clears throat> they were very strate uh, tactically smart in terms of uh, how they would attack ships. At that point in time, whenever ships would, uh, were sailing on the open oceans and they would see a ship far off in the distance, there was sort of an approach avoidance feeling. On the one hand, they wanted to sail closer to the ship to find out if it was a friendly ship, and if it was, then they would sail up and they would exchange mail and news, and of course, that was the only way that information got exchanged on the open sea. But if it was an enemy ship and they sailed too close, of course, there might be some major problems. So the pirates were very deceptive. First of all, they would try and disguise their, sh their ship's uh, ability by uh, dragging heavy things in, in, uh, behind the ship to give the appearance of a, a very slow and inoffensive ship. And they would, they would see the flag of the other ship and then they would raise that same flag. Once again, in order to lure them in closer. And when they were close enough, that would be when they would raise the Jolly Roger. Now, as you can see, the pirates were sort of egomaniacs. They would have their own special flag. And uh, it's a little bit hard to read, but each one of these flags was created for a particular pirate captain. Now, the term Jolly Roger there's some uh, difference of opinion in terms of the origin of that term, Jolly Roger. 
Uh, on the one hand, in, in Old English, Roger, Old Roger was the devil. So Jolly Roger, you can see the connection there. The French, the term Joli Rouge, I mean, I think means pretty red. And some of the, some of the flags, as you can see, were red. So it's hard to tell where the term originated from. But as you can imagine, when the Jolly Roger went up, that just terrified the ship that was being attacked. And quite often, that w they would run their white flag up the mast, and there would be no bloodshed, and the ship would surrender without any problem. I am not going to share with you some of the more graphic examples of pirate brutality. They, they are just so horrifying that I don't want to do that. But I will share with you a few examples. First of all, the rack. Whenever uh, they captured a ship and perhaps uh, individuals on the ship had hidden the treasure, they had a, a bit of time to do that, <clears throat> they would stretch them out on a rack and force them to divulge the location of the hidden treasures. Keel hauling was often used as a disciplinary measure for members of, of the pirate crew. And uh, I always thought that keel hauling, they dropped them in at the bow and dragged them out at the stern. But actually, it was from port to starboard or vice versa. But at any rate, it was a horrible experience. <clears throat> and if the individual did not drown in the experience, they were badly beaten up by all of the, the, the rough surfaces under the ship. Flogging was a very common form of, of pirate brutality. Um, this is a picture of a cat of nine tails. As you'll notice, it's a whip with nine different strands. At the end of each strand, they would put a sharp piece of metal or a piece of glass, and they would flog individuals uh, as many as 39 times, and that often resulted in the individual dying. Now, many of the terms that we use today are associated with the cat of nine tails. Uh, perhaps you have heard the term, let the cat out of the bag. Hardly enough room to swing a cat. Those are all related to the cat of nine tails. One interesting thing about the pirates is that before the ship left port, there was an employment contract that was generally in use that was signed. It, was so, it determined the responsibilities of different individuals, um, what their share of the, the booty would be, disciplinary kinds of, of actions that might be taken for certain offenses. It would determine all of those things. And I've listed over the next few slides some examples that were taken directly out of pirate articles of agreement. First of all, every man shall have an equal vote in the affairs of the moment. This was truly radical. At a point in time when the word democracy was not used at all, each pirate ship was truly a democracy, and they could vote captains in and out very quickly. In fact, there's a recorded instance in two years, one ship had 12 different captains. And so every man on the ship had an equal vote in the affairs of that ship. Every man shall have an equal title to the fresh provisions or strong liquors at any time seized and shall use them at pleasure. In other words, there was an open bar all the time. 24-7, the pirates could have access to the liquor stores. The captain and the quartermaster, and that, that third bullet, bullet here, refers to the division of, of the, the shares of the booty. And one of the uh, share distributions that we've recovered from history is listed here. And without going into it in any great detail, I just want to point out that the lowest person in the hierarchy, an able seaman with two years of experience, would get one share. The captain would get two shares. In other words, just twice as much as the lowest employee on the ship. And uh, of course, income inequality is, is something that we, we talk about today, and, and the, the uh, great amount of money that CEOs receive. In fact, there was a, uh, a survey done by The Economist a year or so ago that the average CEO received 231 
times more than the average employee, not the least paid employee in their organization. So income inequality was not a factor during the age of piracy. A few more articles of faith. The first item there. Uh, they gambled on the ship. That was one of the ways that uh, they played cards and dice and so forth. But they couldn't do it for money. You can imagine in closed quarters, if money was at stake, that that would create a lot of conflict. And so it was forbidden, according to that article of the agreement, uh, to gamble for money. And then the next item, the lights and candles shall be put out at 8 at night. So there was a curfew. All the lights out at 8 at night. But if you wanted to stay up and use that open bar, if any of the crew desire to drink after that hour, they shall sit upon the open deck without lights. They had, un they had compensation for individuals who became handicapped. And so for every kind of, of wound, there was a specified remuneration. If a person, uh, in this particular example, 800 pieces of eight um, for a person who became a cripple or lost a limb in the service. And often those individuals would have a choice. They could either become cooks on the ship or they would set them on land where they would then become landed gentry and buy, buy land and, and become part of society. Okay. This is the way they resolve conflict, conflict resolution. None shall strike another on board the ship, but every man's quarrel shall be ended by shore, on shore by sword or pistol in this manner. And so they, if there was a, 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 a very deep conflict between two individuals, the next time they reached the shore, it would be settled on the shore and not on the ship. And then, of course, the gravest punishment of all was marooning. And this is an article of agreement that referred to that particular punishment. Apparently, if, if a, a person was thinking about deserting the ship or, or conspiring or keeping secrets from, from his uh, compatriots, he shall be marooned with one bottle of powder, one bottle of water, one small arm, and shot. Now, I think a lot of us have, having read Robinson Crusoe, how he was marooned on an island and lived for four years in this uh, tropical paradise. And th th I think that's the picture that most of us have of marooning. Quite often, the pirate was marooned on a sandbar at low tide. And consequently, giving that individual a pistol with shot and powder was a, an act of mercy. The golden age of piracy, 1690 to 1730, and approximately this 40, year of, 40 years uh, period, that is when piracy, there, there were the greatest number of pirates and the greatest amount of plunder taken. 2,000 pirates were sailing the Caribbean at that point in time, and the total plunder during that 40-year period, equivalent to $1,580,000,000 in currency today. And each of the pirates, as you saw with that share distribution a few minutes ago, each of the pirates became wealthy if they made a big score. Thousand pounds was the average value given to each pirate during that 40-year period. And to put it into context, 500 pounds made a man wealthy, more wealthy than 99% of the inhabitants of Europe and America at that point in time. So this was, in fact, a very... Uh, good way to get rich quick if you were successful. <clears throat> now, as you can imagine, these were outlaws, and they just couldn't sail into any port and reprovision, get fresh water and food and sail away. The authorities were always on the lookout for them and wanted to arrest them and then, and then hang them. So they needed ports of refuge. And one of the first ports of refuge it was off the northern coast of Hispaniola, called Tortuga Island. By the way, the name Tortuga in Spanish is turtle. It was inhabited by a lot of sea turtles. That's a picture of it on the left there. So it was just off the northern coast of Hispaniola, current day Haiti. And that is where they were able to gather and then go out and seek their prey. In... 1655, 
The British captured, took away Jamaica from the Spaniards. And the governor of Jamaica was really afraid that the Spaniards would come back in force with all of their fleets and army and retake Jamaica. And so he put the word out across the Caribbean. All pirates, you are welcome to sail into Kingston Harbor and set up a settlement there and we will leave you alone. Even though many of them uh, were, were breaking the British law, they in effect had a sanctuary that they could sail into. And it was a wonderful refuge for them. This, by the way, is a picture of Port Royal uh, in one of the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movies. It was actually just a peninsula, uh, just a few feet above sea level. And over a period of time, it really thrived. 8,000 people, a booming lawless town. It was estimated that every fourth building was either a bar or a brothel. And in fact, one of the, uh, a minister who happened to come by um, at that period of time would later write, since the majority of the population consists of pirates, cutthroats, whores, and some of the vilest persons in the whole of the world, I felt my permanence there was of no use. So he packed up and got out of there. So this was pirate capital of the Caribbean. And every time that the, the cannon would boom at Fort Charles, indicating a pirate ship was returning to the port, all of the inhabitants of Port Royal would rush down to the waterfront for the big auction. In other words, the whole town fenced stolen goods. The pirates would pull up and they'd lay out their, their, their plunder and there would be an auction. And so it was a very, very good place for the pirates. But it did not last. In June of 1692, an earthquake happened. And tsunamis swept over this peninsula. One-fourth of the people living there were drowned at that point in time. The entire settlement was, was uh, destroyed. And, of course, uh, many of the, the ministers felt like that was divine judgment, that Sodom and Gomorrah of the New World had been judged and punished. Just as a brief side note, the current location where that was is the largest underwater archaeological uh, excavation site in the entire Western Hemisphere right now. As you can imagine, since it was so quickly destroyed, everything is still there. And so they are, uh, in effect, excavating under the water and learning more and more about Port Royal. Well, they needed another place to go. Of course, they, they cast around looking for another location. Some of them went back to Tortuga Island. And then the British uh, Navy evacuated what we call current, currently um, the Bahamas. There was concern that the Spaniards uh, on the uh, Florida coast were going to sail over. There'd be a war. They, they didn't feel like they could defend their location, and so they sailed away. The pirates went right into that void. As you can imagine, the, uh, it's in current day Nassau, actually. It's called uh, Providence Island, and it was called New Providence back in those days. It was perfect as a refuge because the bay was shallow enough that British men of war could not sail in, but the, Briti uh, but the pirate ships were able to enter the harbor. There was fresh water available as well. And what is the key to selling real estate? Location, 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 right? And so here they are, the two major routes of ships leaving the Caribbean were through there on the Gulf Stream and then through here and between Cuba and Haiti, current day Haiti. And so they were in a perfect location to intercept the various uh, vessels that they were going to prey on. Now, as we come to the end of our presentation today, um, I'll just share with you a few of the, the, some of the bigger characters in the Pirate Hall of Fame. Black Bart Roberts, I mentioned him just a few minutes ago at, at the very beginning of the lecture. 
captured more than 400 prizes over a 30-month period. Obviously, he had a fleet uh, working for him. Very unusual man. Tall, handsome, a teetotaler, if you can imagine that, and utterly cruel and brutal. He got a well-deserved reputation for, for uh, torturing individuals. He sailed on a ship called the Royal Fortune, and his fortune ran out off the coast of Gabon in uh, Western Africa when a British Navy man of war attacked and he was killed by a blast of grape shot. So he did not last all that long, but long enough to have captured more prizes than any other pirate captain. The biggest hit of all, the biggest score, was scored by Henry Avery. And actually, I, this is one episode that's not in the Caribbean. It was over in the Indian Ocean. Henry Avery intercepted the treasure ship of the Mogul of India. It was the big, biggest score of all time. The value, 500,000 British pounds. In today's money, $166 million. And of course, the average crew share was off the charts. And then we certainly cannot talk about just the, the male pirates. There were some female pirates as well. Uh, Mary Reed and Anne Bonney. Anne Bonney uh, fled an unhappy marriage and eloped with Jack Calico, who's pictured on the right here. Uh, and he was one of the more infam infamous pirate captains. And she became his um, mistress and his co-captain. And in one of their victorious captures of a ship, they noticed that there was a member of the crew on that ship who looked somewhat different than the others. It was Mary Reed. She had been dressed as a, a man for most of her life. Um, and as I was preparing this lecture, I was thinking that's one of the first recorded instances of cross-dressing that I've come across in history. At any rate, Mary Reed was discovered to be a woman. <clears throat> she joined the crew. And the two of them, according to what records we have, became the, one of, some of the best fighters on that pirate ship. They were in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Apparently, they were among the very, very best. Well, uh, sad story, sad ending to the story. Their ship was captured. Calico Jack was hanged. And as Mary Reed and Anne Bonney stood in front of the judge, and he pronounced that they should be killed by hanging, uh, they said, time out, we're both pregnant. True story. So the judge said, all right, in that case then, we will not be able to hang you at this point in time. They went back to uh, the jail. And at, from that point forward, we don't have a 100% record of what happened. Mary Reed died in prison, perhaps in childbirth. And Bonnie's father was a very prosperous merchant and there were rumors that perhaps he was able to buy her freedom. We just don't know. And then any discussion of pirates would not be complete without talking about Henry Teach. In other words, Blackbeard. He was the most charismatic, frightful pirate captain of all time. He would light fuses and stick them in his hair and his head would be wreathed in smoke. He would braid his black beard, and it was a long black beard. He stood six feet four, just a very charismatic, terrifying kind of an individual. And he also was a very brutal individual. He wasn't as successful as many other pirate captains, however. The main thing that he's remembered for is he laid, he put a blockade in front of Charleston, South Carolina. He abducted the uh, city fathers, the most important individuals in the community, and held them ransom until the city would provide uh, what he was looking for in the way of treasure. Well, Charleston didn't have that much in the way of treasure, and he ended up only receiving a medicine chest, and that was the only thing he got from that experience, and he was so upset that he sent the, the city fathers back to Charleston in an open boat without a stitch of clothing on. If you can imagine that. At any rate, he was quite a character. He came to a, uh, a tragic end. 
In Pamlico Sound, Pamlico Sound is a body of water behind the outer banks of North Carolina. He was able to sail his pirate ships into the Sound. Apparently, they needed some rest and recreation. But Lieutenant Maynard of the, her, her Royal uh, Majesty's uh, Navy was able to find him there and attacked. Now, you remember I told you that it was 24 hours a day, uh, uh, the crew could have access to the uh, stores of liquor. Apparently, they had been taking advantage of that. And many of them were unable to mount a defense against this attack. And Lieutenant Maynard and uh, Blackbeard engaged in hand-to-hand -hand close combat. And this is a record that was made of that particular experience. Maynard and Teach... Uh, themselves begun the fight with their swords. Teach broke the guard of Maynard's sword and wounded Maynard's fingers, but did not disable him. Whereupon Maynard jumped back, threw away the sword, fired his pistol, which wounded Teach. One of Maynard's men, giving, uh, being a Highlander, in other words from Scotland, uh, engaged Teach with his broadsword and gave Teach a cut on the neck. Teach saying, well done, lad. The Highlander replied, if it be not well done, it will be done better. With that, he gave him a second stroke, which cut off his head, laying it flat on his shoulder. And they threw the body overboard, and according to eyewitness accounts, it swam three times around the ship before it sank. <laughs> this man had a press agent like you wouldn't believe. Well... The merchants of the various commercial countries said, enough already. They, there were so many pirates in the Caribbean that they could not sail through the Caribbean with their cargoes. And so the, the navies of the maritime countries, especially of, of England, sailed out in search of the pirates. They dedicated their whole resources to that, and they rounded them up. And over a short, after a short period of time, many of the pirates were caught. And on one occasion, when 52 pirates were sentenced in April of 1722, the judge said, ye and each of ye are judged and sentenced to be carried to the place of execution and there to be hanged by the neck until you are dead, dead, dead. And the Lord in his infinite wisdom have mercy upon your souls. They would set up the gallows between low tide and high tide mark on the shore because that's where the maritime law uh, was in effect. They would hang them on the gallows and leave them hanging there. The tides would come and go after a period of time, as you can imagine. Uh, it was not a nice thing to look at at all. And it was a, 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 a lesson to anyone who wanted to go into piracy that this is what would happen to you if you did. And that is the end of the lecture today, but tomorrow... Check your program to find out when it is. I always have to do that because I'm never sure. Uh, we're going to talk about the what-ifs of history, alternative history, counterfactual history. Uh, for example, uh, what if the, the pilgrims had landed where they had intended to land? What if Napoleon had been able to create a French empire in the Western United States as he planned to do? So come tomorrow to hear the answers to those questions. Thank you for coming today.